It is good to see you here tonight, and uh, looking forward to singing together and learning together and just worshiping the Lord together. And um, you be in prayer for Steve. Uh, I think most of you probably know Steve is with his dad up in Ohio. Uh, his dad's in under hospice care, and um, um, I think um, I spoke with him. We spoke with him earlier today, the whole staff, and um, I, it's probably won't be very long. So you be in prayer for him and his family. Uh, some a lot of good stuff coming up. You know, um, next month is Easter, but before then, not this coming Sunday, but the next Sunday, March the third. Uh, we begin the week of prayer for Annie Armstrong, the North American Mission Board offering. And then on the 10th, we'll receive that offering in the morning service. So those, a lot of things are coming up, and so just uh, be aware of those. And uh, I, I'm just so glad to see you here. It's so wonderful to be together. Let me pray for us. Looking forward to Roger breaking open the word for us. And thank you, Lord, for your presence here. We know that you are always uh, everywhere, but we also know, God, that as your sons and daughters gather together, uh, we know you're going to be near as well. Lord, uh, we want to sing for your glory tonight. We want to worship you. We want to learn. And we want to hear from you. As Roger and I were talking earlier, may your Holy Spirit be at work in this room tonight. Lord, we love you. I do pray for Steve and his family. Lord, uh, you know all the ins and outs of that situation, and no one can bring comfort and peace like you can. And so I pray for new grace every day and for mercies, your mercies, Lord. Lord, we love you, and again, I thank you so much for this privilege of gathering. And as we go later, God, may we go bearing your name as your ambassadors. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Oh, you sure don't. Well, I'm going to fix that right now. Very good. All right. So, uh, so this is a wonderful way to start any service, uh, any worship service. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's sing this together, okay? Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. This coming Sunday will be the last Sunday that we uh, are singing our song of the month for February, and that is, This is Our God. But then on the 3rd, we'll begin singing a new song of the month. It's a really powerful song. I've just really fallen in love with it. It's called Firm Foundation. And I wanted to, before we sing these next hymns, I wanted to read you the words, the lyrics to the first verse. What a, I mean, just this very first line, what a statement this is. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations, so why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. 
won't. Amen? Amen. So let's sing these uh, songs of testimony and be thankful in our hearts as we sing for the way God leads us through life. Let's sing together. God leads us along. Here we go. In shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children Let's go. 
ask you a question. I'm going to take a borrow a page from Bill Prang, who did this last week. He always asks a question before he starts his Sunday school class. And the question I have tonight is, uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8, and there's a two-letter word that I see here that I want us to uh, unravel tonight and maybe look into it. And the question is this. Now, don't anybody raise their hand, but I think that everybody here knows what it means to fall in love with somebody. I think we know that. We know what love is, to fall in love with somebody. So I read the first verse of chapter 8, and it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And I stopped there and I said, What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? And I kind of thought about that. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit? That's the contingency, is that we're walking after God's spirit instead of the flesh. Now, when you said yes to Jesus Christ, whenever that was, he made a covenant of grace with you. He made a contact, contract with you. It's almost as if a marriage vow took place. And he said, if you said yes to Christ, you've got a whole plethora of the benefits. You're saved in the book of John. You are justified in the book of Romans. You are sealed in the book of Ephesians, and you are kept by the power of God in 1 Peter. You've got it all. And in that, he, he sanctified you, that is, set you apart to be an example, a child of his. So when you go out into this world and people see you, they don't see just this beautiful woman over here uh, sitting next to her uh, 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 handsome husband. 
but they see somebody that's an example of Christ. And there's other people in this room that I could say the same thing about. But it's the, it's the whole contingency of we're walking after the Spirit. So what does that mean? In verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of the life in Christ, Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. He, knowed a, he knew a long time ago that this old farm boy needed a Savior. Even though I was a good boy in high school, uh, they voted me the best citizen. I got a citizenship award in high school. I'm so glad that they didn't follow me around with a camera and see how I acted sometimes. But anyway, but that didn't do a thing for me. It wasn't until I sat on the, that old broken, hewn out uh, bench in the back of Somerset, Pennsylvania church camp that the preacher was preaching. He said, I don't, I don't remember what he said. But he said, you have to receive Christ as your personal Savior. And the word personal meant something to me. It still does to this day. And so, <clears throat> in Christ, the verse two verses of chapter 8 is our identity. You're not going to see, uh, when they see Gloria, they're not going to see a beautiful woman. They're going to see an example of Christ. And everybody in this room, when you go out into the world, they have to see something different. They see all manners of, of things going on in the world, but, but we have to be somebody different. We are somebody different. We're going to see that in a minute. Now jump down to verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 1 and 2 is your identity. This is a matter of your will. You can say, I want to serve the Lord. I want to walk in His Spirit. We know that back in verse 25 of chapter 7, Paul had this problem. Uh, if we don't need to uh, go there and, and sit there. But he said, the things that I want to do, that I need to do, I'm not doing. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. That's what the world says. And the world says, you're okay. Do you know that the devil sits on the front row of every seat of every church service, and he says, you're okay. Just stay status quo. You're fine. You come to church every Sunday. You, you pray before every meal, and you say your prayers at bedtime. You're, you're in good shape. Don't worry about anything. But that's part of the deception, my friends. And so Paul says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. I said, that's a little bit, uh, little bit contra." Controversy, controversial there. But no, he's just making a, a rhetoric statement. He says, I'm going to serve the law of the Spirit of God in my mind. I've made that determination. Now, uh, I can't believe, I know none of you have ever sinned in this room. <clears throat> but I, I have fallen a couple of times. But, but the Bible says that uh, even though you've, you've tripped and you've stumbled and you fall, I will not utterly cast you down, but I'll lift you up by the powerful right hand of God. Because uh, when you said yes to Jesus Christ, when he asked you to marry him, spiritually speaking, of course, you got, you got the whole package. And he put his spirit within you. And that spirit inside of you is a gentleman. He's not like John Wayne and kicks the door open and makes you do things. That's what the law did, and that's what the law could not do. The, the law cannot save you, could not save the children of Israel. But God had a better plan. Uh, I used this example once before. He looked down through the ages. God had a problem, and we don't ever think about God having a problem. But he looked down through the ages, and he said, how in the world could I, I, I bring sinful man to heaven, a holy, a holy place, because I don't allow sin in heaven. And he looked down through the ages, and he saw uh, Philip Harrington. He said, well, he, he, can, he can redeem people. He's a good preacher. He thought of me. He said, no, no, as good as Philip Harrington is, he's not qualified. Uh, he looked down a little further, and he said, uh, there's some other people. I'll use him. And he said, he's, he's a good preacher. He can save, redeem people. He thought about it and he said, no, as good as Jimmy is, he can't, he can't save people either. I guess I'll have to do it myself. And so he came. 
And uh, we're going to see this in just a second. But drop down to verse 4 now. Or that's where we are. That the, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. It's a matter of the will. I, I'm determined to walk in the Spirit. And sometimes I wake up on a Monday morning and I said, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do anything wrong. I'm going to walk in the love of Christ and follow his spirit and everything will be fine. Guess how long it takes, John, before uh, something comes across my mind or I see something or something happens to me or somebody cuts me off in traffic. Guess how long it is before I react? Not very long. But let me tell you something. That's, That's normal for the rest of us. But the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, and he's quicker than, than we are. And he said, Roger, that's not the way to act. That's not what I want. And he, quicks, he quickens your heart, and he quickens by his spirit. He quickens your heart, and he quickens your mind, because that's a promise of God. He said, I, I don't want you to behave that way. And so it's a matter of the will. Now drop down to verse 9, verse 9 and verse 10. But you are not in the flesh, but you are in the, in the spirit. And if so, you be that the spirit of God. Now, let me, let me give you a little education here. Anytime you see the word if in scripture, and, and especially in this particular case, it doesn't mean I hope so, but it means a matter of a fact. It's sense. If you were to say to me, Roger, uh, it, uh, if I decide to go to the store and get a soda... Uh, uh, you do, you, do you need anything from the store? I said, no, but since you're going to the store, pick me up a soda. You see that? So he's saying here, not if, if you have it, but since you have, because he already said in verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. It's an indicative statement. And he said, uh, since you have the spirit of God who dwells in you, Now drop down to verse 10. Now if any Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now verse verse 10 complements verse 4 back in the beginning because we just said that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And we, we can't obey the law. I made this statement once before, and I, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it, but the Ten Commandments are a great way to live, to live by, the rules to live by, but they cannot save your soul. We can't, and the, the, the Ten Commandments were great, and they are great today, but they will not save you. And that's why God said, I've got to refresh the the commandments that I had given. I've got to refresh them. And in Hebrews, it talks about a new covenant because he said, there's no way that that anybody, that Roger can't live by the law. We can't live by the law. It's a matter of the mind and a matter of the heart. I want to use this example, and forgive me if I get it wrong. But if you were to drive down 129, I don't know what the speed limit is, 55, whatever it is. Let's say 55. And in your mind you say, I'm going to drive, I'm going to drive 54 just to be safe. Well, it, uh, and chances are you're not going to drive 54. Number one, you, don't, you can't read that on your speedometers because it's all analog. We need the digital to, to do that. I guess the new cars have that. But if you say, listen, I want to drive uh, responsibly down 129 here, the speed limit says 55. That's what the law says. If you were to drive 56, legally you'd be in trouble. You'd be violating the law. And that's why the children of Israel couldn't obey Christ, couldn't obey the law, because they didn't have it in the heart. In Ezekiel, he said, I'm going to take out your stony heart, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to write my laws on your heart. Because when you're in love with somebody, it affects your heart. And you want to be around that person. You want to be in their presence. You want to do everything for them and to please them and be around them and just be with them. And that's what it means to be in Christ back in verse 1. 
There isn't any condemnation now. Raj, I know that you, I know that you walk funny. I know that you got some problems. I got my faults. I, I don't know what they are, but I, I've been told I have some. But anyway, but because, because, because it's in the, the body, in the flesh, and not in my heart, God says, I've already dealt with that. That's why I had him sing that uh, we all came through the water, some through the flood, but we all came through the blood. When the blood ran down that old rugged cross, it sealed forever your pardon. There are two operative words here, pardon and redeemed. The only way that you can be redeemed and pardoned is the blood. That's why I had him sing it that second time. And you can keep all the laws in the world. If you could keep all Ten Commandments, and I don't know anybody that's keep all Ten Commandments. I do not. If you could keep them all, and that was, and that was your entrance into heaven, and that was your, your eternal life, and, uh, and you had, did all the right things and won all the Bible study classes and won all this, the, the, uh, the spirituality that you wanted, maybe that would... Uh, if that, if that could make you, give you eternal life and get you to heaven and spend eternity with God, uh, but that's, that's impossible to do. And so, down in verse 9 and 10, this is our application. But you're not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. And then down in verse uh, 10, and if Christ, and since Christ is in you, not if, and since Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. He put that label, he put that wardrobe on you when you said yes to him. He gave you righteousness. That's why, folks, we have to hate our sin. Because the Holy Spirit when you make a sin, if you gossip about somebody or whatever sin you have in your life, no, I'm not looking at you. I don't. I've, Randy's got on me before about, about all that, but anyway. When, when, you, when you recognize your sin, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman inside you. He's not going to force you to do anything, but he's going he's gonna to lovingly say, That's, that doesn't please me. And folks, let me tell you something. Any decision that you make, regardless of what it is, if you can answer these two questions, you can, you can be pretty sure that you're on the right track. Number one, does it please the Lord Jesus? And number two, will it benefit the body of believers? If you can answer yes to both of those questions, more than likely you're on the right track. And I hate my sin, folks. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You don't need to know. Don't you, don't you ask. You don't, but I'm saying, I, I hate my sin. And we've got to get to the point where we say, you know what, Lord? If it's, if it's, if I'm talking about my neighbor, that's a sin to God. Any faith, anything that's not of faith, it's sin to God. And we've all missed that mark. We all have. But he said, I've already dealt with it, Raj. And that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit who dwells in you. He'll make you alive. And you can be, uh, we don't have time to get into it, but Paul says, before, before the law came, I was alive. I was doing everything I wanted. Anything I wanted to do, I was alive. Then the law came and said, you can't do that. You've got to drive 55 miles an hour. Well, I feel like driving 90. But when the law, when the, but when the Spirit comes in, Roger, drive responsibly. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's 55, maybe it's even 57. But you're being responsible because now it's in the heart and not some checklist I do every morning and say, well, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to make sure I don't do that because it's in the heart now and you're operating by the Spirit. Down in verse 12, we have, we have the identity, we have the matter of the will, we have the application, and down in verse 12, brethren, we are not debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. 
and verse 13, uh, if you die, if you, if you follow after the flesh and you do, do those things that come naturally, regardless of the spirit, but if through the spirit you do mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. That word mortify means put to death. <clears throat> and you don't need to go over there, but chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And you're all familiar with this. I was talking to a gentleman just before service. And folks, I don't know about you, all of you here, but most of us, uh, it's a battle between the enemy and the Holy Spirit who lives within you. Uh, let, me say, let me say this. I've shared this before, and some of you uh, said you've you got you to gotta stop saying it. The devil does not care anything about you. You're no threat to him. But the devil hates Jesus Christ with a passion. And anything that, that you align yourself with the Lord Jesus, he is going to come after you and, and irritate you to the point where you, you just want to kick him in the face. And his, he's not done. Do you think that when Jesus said that the body is dead because of sin, but that you're alive because of the spirit, do you think that Satan's going to give up on you? He's going to come after you, and he's going to do whatever it takes. I used this illustration before, and uh, but I believe that uh, every nine every morning at nine o'clock, Satan has a board meeting. He tells his demons, "Here's what you got to do today. I want you to get a hold of John, and I want you to stop him. I want you to do everything possible." To don't let him remember one verse of scripture. Don't let him even acknowledge Christ. Do whatever it takes. Irritate that guy until he, until he drops because I don't want one more thing about Jesus coming out of his mouth because he's a good witness to where he works and, and the Satan can't stand that. But the greatest news, and you know this, greater is he that lives in you than, what is it? He that lives in the world. And that's the power of God. That's why we're kept. That's why we're sealed in Ephesians. That's why we're justified in Romans. Because God knew that from the beginning. He said, poor Roger's going to need a Savior. He's going to need somebody to help him. You're not going to set my boy out, out there in the world alone. He's going to need a Savior because I know his future and I know what's coming. And if he doesn't, if he, if, if we don't get him as, a, as my son, we're going to lose him. Jesus said that. I didn't know anything at 10 years old, but a 10 year old boy. I knew, I knew that I said, and I said to the preacher, I said, you mean to tell me that if Jesus died on that old rugged cross, just for me, he said, absolutely. Because he knows what sin does. He knows the effects of it. And he said, I've, I've got to say that this law that you put up here, these, these speed limit signs, they're not doing it. I live off of 90. And every night it's like a raceway. They get two or three cars and, and all souped up and run up and down there. And, and uh, they're certainly not going 55 anyway. Let's get back to Scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons are warfare, they're not carnal, but they are mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds. It's mighty through God. You can, you can imagine anything and make up your mind, I'm not going to sin today. I'm not going to sin today. I'm going to be perfect today. And it won't be long. But when it says mighty through Christ... Look at verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. Instead of using fancy words, 
Do you know what I told somebody the other day? They were having problems and this and that. I said, take it back to Calvary. You go back to Calvary and you look up at Christ hanging on that cross and the blood running down the cross and you get the idea that he's there to take care of the natural old man of sin so it won't dominate you anymore. You're going to come away with a better attitude. You're going to be a better parent, a better Sunday school teacher, a better preacher, a better singer. Because now you realize that you're not under any control other than the Holy Spirit. Satan's going to needle you, but sometimes you just have to laugh. And you said, remember Calvary? I told him the other day, uh, I know you people might think I'm a little odd, but I was out in my shop and I was having a problem. And I was getting frustrated. I got to admit, I was getting frustrated. And nothing was working right. And uh, I broke a tool. And I was, I, was getting, I was getting upset, Randy. I was getting frustrated. But uh, something dawned on me. And I knew, I knew that, that I had to do this tonight. And this week, he's needled me uh, too many times. I said, why don't you go back to the pit where you belong, Satan? Better yet, on your way back to the pit, stop at Calvary <coughs> and see what Christ did. And Satan's, Satan knows the scripture. He knows the Bible. He just doesn't want you to believe it and understand it. That's part of their deception. Jesus had to buy back at Calvary what Satan stole in the garden a long time ago because he knows, he knows how we're made. He just can't stand Jesus. Um, you can talk about God all day long. And, and it doesn't really bother him. It irritates him a little bit, but it doesn't bother him. But you mentioned Jesus Christ, and Satan has to leave. That's why he told, uh, that's why he left when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness. You know, when he was being tempted, and, and Jesus was quoting scripture, Satan said, I can't stand this. I have to leave. But all I'm saying, folks, is casting down imaginations and every evil thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We got to take captive. <clears throat> so in Romans chapter eight, verses one and two, we have we have the um, the um, the identity. That's who we are. We're beautiful people. This outward appearance. We're all beautiful people. The outward appearance doesn't mean a thing. This is just a vehicle to get you through life. But what's inside is the Holy Spirit operating in you. Because this body isn't going to go to heaven. Our soul will. And we're going to have a brand new body. I promise you that someday, according to Scripture, <clears throat> my mother and father are buried in the family cemetery in Pennsylvania. And your loved ones on that day, the last day when that trumpet sounds, they're going to hear that trumpet. You say, Roger, how is that possible? Because my loved one died 30 years ago, 20 years ago. They're going to hear that trumpet. And when they belong, if they're saved, they're going to come out of that grave, a glorified body. Because we know that from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain, that means that some of us are going to be alive at that time, we're all going to meet each other in the air and spend eternity with, with the Father. And so when it says bring everything to the obedience of Christ, take captive all of those things that come into your mind, that come into your heart, whatever it might be, because the thoughts and imaginations... Listen, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Nobody is going to come to your house and put a gun to your head and said, you either accept uh, 
deny Christ or I'm going to shoot you. That's not going to happen. I'm sad to say that does happen to some people. But we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, folks, folks, but against principalities and powers and the things in your mind. <clears throat> and one, one thing, when a thought comes to your mind, it's easier to deal with it when it's in your mind. Because if it travels 18 inches and gets down into your heart, it's a lot harder to get rid of. So when a thought comes to your mind, let's say this precious lady right here. I can't walk too far because they said you only got three feet. But anyway, when this precious lady, if she said something mean to me, I said, boy, I can't wait to get even with her. I'm going to get even somehow. But uh, I said, Lord, every emotion that we will ever face in our entire life, every, every emotion that we will ever face, Jesus has already been there, dealt with that, paid for it in full. Every emotion. He went through it physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. And so we've got, we've got that, that power within us. Now, that's not to say that we're, we're not going to make mistakes. We're not going to fall. But my friends, the spirit is a gentleman, like I said before. <clears throat> if I start to gossip about this precious lady here, the Holy Spirit, the gentleman, said, you, you get on the phone and you call her. What I said to somebody about this precious lady, and you make it right. That pleases God, and that displays the righteousness that God has already put on you. I guarantee you, if you bought a new, I'll talk to a guy here. If you bought a new coat, you'd be proud of that thing. You'd want to wear it to church. You know, I don't know what you ladies wear, uh, buy or blouses or thing or whatever, sweaters, whatever. But you'd be proud of that. And that's part of the righteousness that he put on you when you said yes to him. Now, let me close with this. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. Second Corinthians 15. It's not Second Corinthians, it's First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 15. In verse, he, in verse 58, he starts this, uh, says this, "Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, inasmuch as you know." that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast. And I've got a highlight in my, in my note in my Bible here. Payday is coming. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what you have to do. But you keep on the firing line. You keep witnessing for Christ. Even if it's a cup of cold water, in Jesus' name, because folks, time is short, and Satan knows he's he's on the end of his leash, and he's like a barking dog. And he knows that uh, the time is coming, but he just doesn't want you to believe it. But uh, be steadfast, because there's a payday coming. And there are seven words that I want to hear from my Lord. And I don't deserve it. And I'm not trying to, to, to be, have false humility here. But I do not deserve heaven. It's only because of the blood that ran down that old rugged cross. And if, if we get that in our minds and in our hearts... That's going to do it. The seven words I want to hear. And you know what they are. Start it out. Well, good and faithful servant. I don't deserve that. But because, because of what he has done for me, my righteousness, and gave me, saved me, sealed me, keeps me, according to scripture in First Peter, 
gave me righteousness. If you were to follow me around with a camera, you'd say, I don't, I have to edit this part out. He's, that's not righteousness. But it's part of his, he's already dealt with sin. And we've got to hate our sin. And we've got to acknowledge the fact that he's, he's done it all for us. And it's to him that we owe everything. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning on going here, but just let me read you one last scripture. And then I'm right on time. Early as usual. Jude chapter 24. Listen to this. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. Did we get that? Keep you from falling. To present you faultless before the... the I'm sorry. I get tears in my eyes and I can't see. To keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of glory with exceeding great joy. He's going to present me faultless and blameless before the Father. Why? Why? What did I do? But uh, I won't pick on I won't pick on Randy, but I was going to have uh, going to have him come up here and but anyway, that's a whole different story. But he's going to present us faultless, folks, only because of one place, that old garbage dump outside of Jerusalem where Jesus died. That's what it was. It was a garbage dump. Our precious Lord gave his life. He said, nobody, nobody took my life from me. I laid it down freely on that old garbage dump because of Roger and for everybody in here. Because we need a Savior. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Holy Spirit, translate what I awkwardly tried to say tonight and pierce every heart in here that tomorrow morning when they wake up and they're having their coffee or when they're going about their business, let them be reminded of what we shared tonight that you have already established and taken care of the sin nature. And when we do make a mistake, when we do have temptations, put in their heart, Satan, remember Calvary. Remember Calvary. And that'll take care of it. Thank you, Father, for being so faithful to me. For Christ's honor and for his glory. Amen. Amen.